the Most High is God the Father. Well, under God the Father in the sanctuary was not Christ. It was the angels because their wings were overshadowing the mercy seat and the mercy seat represented Christ and also the high priest, of course. But so you're, you're thinking, wait a minute, Mesa, what are you talking about? The angels are higher than Christ? Well, yeah, because Christ was made a little lower than the angels, right? So you have the Father who is the most high, and even Jesus said in John 14, 28, my Father is greater than I. But then he was, as he was saying that, my Father is greater than I, he was in the experience of being made a little lower than the angels for the suffering of death. You can read that in Hebrews 2. So you have the Father, the angels, and Christ, right? And that's what you can see on the cross. Moses and Aaron and um, Bezalel and Aholiab were able to work together in such a way where they were able to take a record of all the things that they made. And it's really good stuff because now you can know that God, being a specific um, judge, being a God of order, being one that when he gives a command, he expects us to follow as his children, not because he's domineering and, and you know, like um, somebody who just wants his own way. No, he recognizes that he has a purpose that is for our good. And so if we did everything perfectly the way that God would want us to, we would all be beyond happy. We, we would have the greatest life possible. So it's like God wants us to follow him, not because he's right and it's just because he wants to be in charge. No, it's actually for our good. So the sanctuary, the way that, the, that he had related, God had related to Moses, that he wanted it to be done just like this, it was for a purpose because it illustrates all the beautiful truths of the Bible that we have learned, whether it be salvation and repentance and the nature of Christ and who God is and the different heights, etc. And uh, yesterday, actually, I was, I was blessed with the thought that um, the Father is the Shekinah glory and he is the highest. Okay, the highest, you know, even the demons know that. They said to Christ, we know who you are, the son of the highest or the son of the most high God. And so the most high is God the Father. Well, under God the Father in the sanctuary was not Christ. It was the angels because their wings were overshadowing the mercy seat and the mercy seat represented Christ and also the high priest, of course. But so you're thinking, wait a minute, Mesa, what are you talking about? The angels are higher than Christ? Well, yeah, because Christ was made a little lower than the angels, right? So you have the Father who is the Most High, and even Jesus said in John 14, 28, my Father is greater than I. But then he was, as he was saying that, my Father is greater than I, he was in the experience of being made a little lower than the angels for the suffering of death. You can read that in Hebrews 2. So you have the Father, the angels, and Christ, right? And that's what you can see on the cross. You can see the Father in Psalm 18. He was above the clouds, the clouds of darkness there that had come over the land. That could represent angels because it was actually clouds, but angels are represented by clouds as well. And then the one under that was Christ, made a little lower than the clouds or the angels. So you have the Father, the Most High, you have the clouds or the angels, and then you have Christ on the cross. And so when you go through these concepts of the Father, the Son, and the angels, and sometimes it's in the order of the Father, the angels, and Christ, you realize there's a reason. And do you know that in the order of the Father, the angels, and Christ, that's the order that you find in the third angel's message. <laughs> Read it for yourself. Revelation chapter 14, verses 9 through 12, you will find... In verse 11, 12, 10, I believe it is, that God is mentioned, and then the holy angels, and then the Lamb in that order. So there's the Father, the angels, and the Lamb, which was under the shadow of the Almighty, because the angels are the ones casting the shadow of the Almighty. And so anyways, just that's what I was learning yesterday. As I was driving with somebody who asked me a little bit about the Father and the Son. So just last night I was able to share kind of like a bucket load because we only had a few minutes left. And so I just dumped a whole wheelbarrow on him and said, sorry, man, I, I didn't mean to like overload you, but I'm excited when I talk about this stuff. He's like, no, it's good. It's good. And he also wants to learn too. So pray for him. And I'm not going to mention who that is. But anyways, um, 
I am excited to be able to share what the Bible says here in Exodus 39. And we're coming on to a new paragraph. We've already talked about all the various things, the sockets of the court, and how that represents the righteousness, not only of the saints, but also of Christ, because it's Christ in you, and how the gate was the same height as the fine linen. And that's just fascinating, too, because you're talking about the nature of Christ. But now, of the blue, the purple, the scarlet, they made cloths of service. Okay. Now, this is an interesting verse because it uses the word holy twice. Okay. It's the service in the holy, and they made holy garments for Aaron. Well, we know that the garments are holy, but I don't think that's what the verse meant. I think, and this may have been something that the translators didn't catch on to, but I know that these garments, the blue, purple, and scarlet, were made cloths for the service. What service? It was for the Day of Atonement service. This is for the day that only the high priest goes into what place? The holy of holies okay so i think and i'll find out in heaven for sure but i think that this verse should have been translated that the blue the purple the scarlet were made of cloths of service to do service in the holy of holy place the holy of holies and made the garments for aaron okay that's why they made the garments for aaron is because he was going to be in the holy of holies so now in the translation, they separated it. It's the service in the holy place, and they made the holy garments for Aaron. But I don't think that was the purpose. Uh, you probably understand what I'm saying, I would think, because you know that when the high priest dresses like this, it's only on one day, and it's in the holy of holies that he goes. And so the holy of holies is why they made the garments for Aaron, as the Lord had commanded Moses. And so it does it, I think, again in this chapter, but definitely here in verse 1. It seems as though these holies should have been placed together instead of separated as they were. And they're only separated by one word here. So if this word holy was over here on this other side, then it would make sense that the service was in the holy of holies made for the garments for Aaron. Or that's why the garments were made for Aaron is because he would be serving in the holy of holies. Okay, verse 2, when he made the ephod of gold, of blue, of purple, and scarlet, and fine twine linen. Then that's what the high priest would use on the Day of Atonement. Now, remember, we have seen these things before when we've looked at this picture. And we saw that the garments were made generally of blue, and you can see here in this section, that's the first part that, um, above, of course, the white. And by the way, Christ is mentioned in Revelation chapter 1, as wearing the white garment, which is like the undercoats, if you will, the, the general coats for the priests. And then later in the book of Revelation, you find that he go, he's um, seeing inside the tent of the tabernacle, or the tent of the tabernacle of the testimony in heaven. And that's because he's seeing into the most holy place. That would mean that he's not just wearing the white, he's also wearing all this stuff. So I think in the book of Revelation, without reading it, you can imply that Christ actually changes his garment from just the white with the turban, um, and then he later puts on the blue and the regular garments because he is the high priest. And you see him in chapter 1 as just dressed as the priest. So anyways, this, this image here is what we looked at before, and we're going to see that he made the ephod of gold, blue, purple, scarlet, and fine twine linen. And that's what we had looked at <clears throat> a little more in detail previously. They did beat the gold into thin plates. Now, what did they beat the gold into thin plates for? It was for this section right here, where you're looking at what's, uh, where the gems representing the 12 tribes of the children of Israel were, were placed, right? And so they beat the gold into thin plates and cut it into wires to work it in the blue, in the purple, in the scarlet, and in the fine twine linen with cunning work. Now, I'm not sure what that describes, but it seems to me that somehow the um, gold in these thin plates was kind of weaved into the actual garment. So it's not like you could separate it from the garment. I don't know, but it says they were cut into wires to work it in the blue and the purple and the scarlet and in the fine twine linen. So the, the thin plates, I don't think were the gold uh, chains necessarily that hooked it all together. It seems as though there's there are the gold plates that are a span 
that's described a little bit later. Here we'll talk about it now in verse 4. They made shoulder pieces for it to couple it together. And the shoulder pieces would be right here. These shoulder pieces, not necessarily the Urim and the Thummim, but these, um, these bands here that were uh, described as well, probably beaten for uh, real thin, as was the breastplate as well. Uh, beaten real thin so that you know you don't have a block of gold on your chest it's just a thin piece that is doubled together as described later oh right here actually they made shoulder pieces for it to couple it together by the two edges was it coupled together and i think the two edges would be like this edge and this edge and or this edge and this edge now it's possible that these two uh, this part right here the um breastplate was actually made up of two pieces like this that were kind of coupled together so that the stones are on the inside of those two pieces that are coupled together. I'm not sure because I, I don't understand the language. Like I'm a visual person, so if they showed me a picture of it, I'd be like, oh, I get it. And this illustration that I'm showing you, you know, with the, uh, the, the picture of the priest, that doesn't give us the details that I'm, I think we're finding here in the verse. But anyways going back to verse 4 by the two edges was it coupled together and the curious girdle of his ephod that was upon it was of the same now the curious girdle of the ephod is this piece right here this um it's of the same meaning it's it's connected like with these portions right here on the edges just like we talked about the portions connected here and i don't know if this is too thick where there's one on the inside and one here on the outside that you can see but it's the curious girdle of his ephod that was upon it. It was of the same according to the work thereof. Gold, blue, purple, scarlet, fine twine linen, as the Lord had commanded Moses. Now, what does this all mean? Well, of course, we know that the uh, gold represents our faith tried in the fire. You can find that in Peter. The blue, according to Numbers 15, is dealing with the faithfulness to the commandments of God. And that's, remember, why we have the uh, gold tried in the fire, which Christ offers to the Laodicean church. And we also know that uh, he says, buy of me gold without money and without price in, in the book of Isaiah. I believe it's chapter 55. I'm not sure. But the blue and why the woman in the book of Matthew tried to grasp the edge or the border of Christ's garment is because he wore blue on the borders of his garment too and that symbolizes his righteousness and that's how she was healed and so the gold tried in the fire which is the faith that is tried in the fire the blue which represents the righteousness something that the harlot of revelation 17 does not wear if you remember the purple representing uh, as was mentioned before not only the blue and the scarlet or red combined but it's also the idea of um, royalty so then, you know, you have Christ, which has the gold faith that is necessary. We have his righteousness that is necessary, his divinity or his royalty, which is necessary, and also his life and death represented by the blood or the scarlet color. The fine twine linen is his righteousness in the life of the saints. And it's as the Lord commanded Moses. So all these colors, the girdle, the the coverings, everything had a meaning that would illustrate the sanctuary services and also the salvation that it represented. They wrought onyx stones enclosed in ouches of gold, graven as signets are graven with the names of the children of Israel. And I think those onyx stones could very well be the, um, the um, Urim and the Thummim, because I believe those also were onyx. But, and they had the names, if I recall, of the children of Israel on them, just like the names were on these on the breastplate as well. So he put them on the shoulders of the ephod, as we saw just a moment ago, that they should be stones for a memorial to the children of Israel, as the Lord commanded Moses. So everything is done as the Lord commanded Moses. So the reason why is because God had a specific reason. Like, for example, when he said to Moses, like, okay, I want you to smite the rock one time and it will bring forth water. Well, Moses was upset and he smote it twice, remember? 
Well, Moses wasn't able to go into the land of Canaan as a result because what he did is he messed up the symbolism of the gospel. And so he, well, no, he was only supposed to speak to the rock and then he smote it twice. Isn't that what happened? I think that's what happened. The first time he was supposed to smite it and then the next time he was supposed to speak to it, but he smote it twice. So um, I don't remember exactly. You're going to have to correct me if I'm wrong. But what happened is he, he messed up the symbolism. And God was trying to express in symbolism the application to his people of how they will receive the mercies from heaven. And Moses, in his anger, decided to smite the rock instead of speak to it. I think that's what happened. And after the rock was smitten the first time and water came out, then the next time you come and speak to it. You don't have to strike it again. And that's what was going on. But Moses struck it twice. And so now God is saying, oh, Moses, no, 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 no. I, I didn't want that. Okay, so we'll work with it, but you're going to have to like, you know, pay the price, if you will. So Moses is in heaven. He was resurrected after his death. You can read about that in Jude. And there was this argument over his body. But um, yeah, Moses, he could have done better. And it would have illustrated the salvation plan better, right? And so Moses here, though, he's making sure that Aholiab and Bezalel and all the helpers are doing it just like the God said, because like, you know, hey, God said it, let's do it the way he wanted it to be done. And everything has a purpose. And so this sanctuary actually came out really well, just as God had commanded it, because it illustrates everything that God was doing through his son. Now, last night in the, in the vehicle, I was also explaining some of the Hebrew traditions of um, the seven yearly festivals. And every year for the, the Israelites illustrated the 2,000 years that Christ would be in heaven after his life on earth until his second coming and even beyond. But we're just going to say to the second coming. So every single year, the children of Israel did seven yearly festivals. And that illustrated the order of Melchizedek, where Christ would go one time through each of those seven festivals. Right now he's in the Day of Atonement, which is the sixth of the seven. And so we have this um, experience where the children of Israel were supposed to do everything over and over and over again every year so that they can understand the plan of salvation after the cross. And um, so that's why God wanted this to be done so perfectly because the high priest needed to wear blue for a purpose. He needed to have a golden girdle for a purpose. He needed to have white underneath the blue for a purpose. He needed to have something on his forehead with specific words written for a purpose. And it was to be connected with a blue band for a purpose. You see, so all these things have meaning. And the more we get to know the sanctuary, the more, as especially you read the book of Revelation, you're able to say, wow, now I get it. This is what it means. And this is what God was illustrating when he told the children of Israel in the Levitical priesthood to do it a certain way to illustrate the order of Melchizedek, which actually matters. I mean, yeah, that mattered, but it was all a type that led to the anti-type, or this was like symbolism that led to that which was in reality. And right now we're in the reality of God's plan, which is under the order of Melchizedek. So going back now to the idea that Moses was commanded, and it was done just as Moses had commanded. And he made the breastplate of cunning work, like the work of the ephod, of gold, blue, purple, scarlet, and of fine twine linen. Now, so the uh, the breastplate was made, and I bet you that's what it is. It's interwoven, like this one is, with the gold. So there's the, the golden plates, if you will, and then it's interwoven with the blue and the red and the fine linen. And that's why I think it here says he made the breastplate of cunning work, because we know what the breastplate is. It's this, this thing here with the stones on it, like the work of the ephod of the different colors. And so everything had to be specifically colored. You couldn't just throw in green there because God didn't ask for green. Yes, green is a symbolic color, but not there in the sanctuary. So he wasn't going to wear something that it was a random color when you're making something for the high priest. He had a purpose. And the fine twine linen is, of course, similar to what the court was surrounding the holy and most holy place with. It was four square. They made the breastplate double, and that's what I was referring to before. It had two sides. 
A span, which is like the, um, if you just take your hand and you spread it like this, it's about that size. Okay, just put that on your chest. That's about the size of how the breastplate was on the high priest's garment. It was about the span, which is between the fingers, the thumb and the, and the small finger there. And so it was a span the length thereof and the span the breadth thereof being doubled. And so it was square and it was doubled. And so that's why I think like there was likely the back end of it and then the front end of it. And there might have been holes in the front end of it, 12 of them. The stones were placed in there. And then you were able to put that front or top cover on or, you know, the front cover so that the stones were revealed through that, uh, the, the second side, if you will, because it's doubled over. And um, not sure if that's the case, but it makes sense to me if I, like I said, I'm not the builder, but if I were the builder, um, that's probably how I would make it. Verse 10, they set it in four rows of stones. The first row was sardis, topaz, carbuncle. That's the first row. The second row was emerald, sapphire, and diamond. Now, so we know this is green, we know this is blue, and we know this is like clear, right? And so I've got this picture here, and I want to show you that in the second row, this is, um, uh, what was that now? Emerald, which is greenish. I know that's bluish, but there's a greenish, there's sapphire, and there's diamond, okay? So I think this picture found online, it's, it's not uh, hard to find, and it's grainy. I just found it last night while I was um, preparing for showing it this morning, so it, I didn't find the best picture because it was late at night and I was tired, <laughs> sorry. But you have the, uh, the stones that were likely in this kind of order, and uh, you can see that the last one, I believe, is um, Jasper, right? So you have the last one, Jasper. And there's black onyx and Jasper. And that's why you have black here and Jasper. So those are the colors I know for sure. Those three here. This one's a little curious because it's not green. But uh, we know that Jasper is green and also that um, onyx is, can be black. Onyx is a, a bunch of different colors. It's beautiful. And uh, so anyways, that's, that's an interesting... I think, picture of what could potentially have been the, uh, the way it looked. Although I don't think that it was like um, as square as this. It seems as though, I mean, maybe there was like these ouches, the Bible calls it, that's around each of the stones. And I'm not sure how it was made, but this was definitely blue, purple, and scarlet. It wasn't just blue. And so it's not perfect, but, you know, you can see that this image illustrates how they might have been laid out. Um... Oh, sorry, that, that's the one, Jasper. I looked. I don't know where I saw Jasper earlier. Maybe that's the one I pointed to, I'm not sure, but that's the fourth row. There On the third row is Ligure, Agate, and Amethyst. The fourth row was Beryl, Onyx, and Jasper. They were enclosed in ouches of gold in their enclosings, and that's what I meant with these ouches of gold. Why they're called ouches, I don't know, but it's like a border, something raised up, and when you look at the uh, meaning, it, it is either of silver or gold. So this ouch is, is rightly represented here with a raised up golden kind of border. And uh, almost like a brooch, if you will. Each one is like its own brooch. Now verse 14, the stones were according to the names of the children of Israel. Twelve according to their names, like the engravings of the signet, or of a signet, every one with his name, according to the twelve tribes. So I didn't do this, but this first one would be Reuben because he was the oldest and he was the one, you know, that uh, was mentioned first. So it's like Reuben and then the next son, the next son in age, the next son in age, the next son in age. You could probably do that and it wouldn't be hard to find that. Um, every, not every time that the Bible gives you the, how would you say? Not every time that the Bible gives you the order of the children of Israel, are they in the same order? But I think when you go to like Genesis, what, oh man, like 49, I think it is, where you're going to find the, the names of the children of Israel. And I don't remember what chapter, I th somewhere around there. You'll find the order, okay? And then you'll be able to see likely what names were ri uh, written on what stones, if you wanted to do that homework. I didn't during this time, so uh, feel free to do it if you're interested. And they made upon the breastplate chains at the end of wreath and work of pure gold. And I think that's what these chains are here, the specifically mentioned. How they're, they're, the connections were referred to earlier where there's connected at the corners. But this, these are the chains. And uh, those chains, 
I don't know what the chains represent, but they're made of gold, pure gold, and I know what that represents. So there's definitely a network between all these different things on the priest's garments. This is the how God would answer yes or no with the two Urim and the Thummim. And those are through fine gold. They're connected to the breastplate, which is over the heart of the high priest. And the children of Israel are named, every one of them individually, on the breastplate of this high priest because this um, symbolizes all the children of Israel. That means you and me. We're on the heart of the high priest. And it's connected to how God gives us answers to yes and no, or yes and no, depending on which way it was. And so all the blue and the gold, uh, the, the gold and the red and the purple all have meanings. And they made two ouches of gold and two gold rings and put the two rings in the two ends of the breastplate. And I think those are the, the rings that we referred to earlier as well. And they put the two wreath and chains of gold in the two rings on the ends of the breastplate, which of course we just talked about with these right here, both on the top and the bottom. Okay. So then it says the two ends of the two wreath and chains, they fastened in the two ouches and they put them on the shoulder pieces of the ephod before it, which I think is illustrated right here. And th these circular things, I guess, would be the ouches illustrated here. I'm not sure. But, and they made two rings of gold and put them on the two ends of the breastplate upon the border of it, which was on the side of the ephod inward. You see what I mean? So there's the side of the ephod inward, and that would mean there's the side outward as well. That's why I think that the... Um, the breastplate here had two sides. One was inward toward the ephod and one was outward toward you where you're seeing it with these stones here and the ouches surrounding each of those stones. So, and that of course would, would bring you near to the heart of God. You've heard that song probably, you know, near to the heart of God. That's, you're near to the heart of God through the only mediator between God and men. You are illustrated on the stones, the name of the tribes of Israel, on the heart of the high priest, which comes right before God when he offers your prayers to him. And so through the only mediator between God and men, we are near to the heart of God because we're drawn close through that mediator, which is our brother, Jesus Christ. You know, I was, I was talking with somebody the other day and they were saying, well, this is a brand new uh, student, if you will, in the father and the son concept. It was about two days ago. She called and she said, I have questions. Well, that was actually about three or four days ago. And then I said, call me anytime. And she said, I'll call you on Thursday. And so on Thursday she called and she says, I've got questions. What is the Trinity concept all about? I've heard so much about it. And I said, hey, you've called the person that is really interested to talk about this. So Thanks for calling. Anyways, we were going back and forth and she was ask, asking about the, uh, the idea of Christ being our brother, but also it says that he's our everlasting father. Like, how does that work? And I said, okay, depending on the way that you're looking at it, because they're both, you know, symbolic, if you will. We are symbolically the brother of Christ, if you will. We're not actually, because it's by adoption. And so we here on the earth are symbolically in heavenly places in Christ and we can be his brother because he became human. And then with this idea of being the everlasting father in Isaiah 9 verse 6, I asked her the question, according to Galatians chapter 4, I believe it's verse 26, who is the mother of us all? And she said, Eve? I said, no, it's not, not in that verse, but you're right because we well came from Eve. But according to that verse, Galatians 9 verse, uh, sorry, 4 verse 26, I'm going to look it up for you. It uh, is Galatians 4 verse 26. Who is the mother of us all? Jerusalem, which is above, is free, which is the mother of us all. So Jerusalem is the mother of us all. Now, according to Revelation chapter 21, who is the one that actually has a bride? And I said, is it the father or the son? She goes, well, it's the son. I said, exactly. So the son has a bride, which is the mother of us all. So who would that make him? And she was like, oh, the father of us all. I said, right. So in that symbolic concept of 
he marrying Jerusalem, there's the father or the, yeah, the father and the mother concept, and we would therefore be the children. I said, so in that sense, we are the sons of Christ, but we are also the brother. So symbolically, depending on which way you're looking at it. And I said, interestingly, that makes God the father, our grandfather. And just to say it's kind of weird because the Bible doesn't say it, but if you're able to understand the Hebrew concept, you go and, and you realize that in the concepts of the Hebrew mind, the people even during Christ's day were able to call Abraham our father, not our great, 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 whatever grandfather. And so when they were calling Abraham their father, he was really their great times a bunch grandfather. And so we could call God the father, our father, in that sense where Christ is our everlasting father joined together with the mother of us all, we can call him our father just as they called Abraham their father. But in reality, Abraham was the great, 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 whatever grandfather. So for us, in that sense, the father is our grandfather. So like the great one in Africa, you would call him Mze. That's the aged one, the old man. And that is actually a term of respect. And uh, when I said that to a group in, in, us, in um, Kenya, they started laughing because they hadn't really called God Mze yet. But after that, uh, we talked about that. He's like the ancient of days, you know, the, the old one, the old man. And so um, that's just another way to think about this. So when you're looking at this concept of Christ being the brother and the mother, you know, com combined with the mother of us all, you can understand Isaiah 9 verse 6 a little better that way. Anyways, going back to our study. They made two other golden rings and put them on the two sides of the ephod underneath toward the forepart of it over against the other couplings thereof above the curious girdle of the ephod. So there's the forepart and there's the inward part, right? So that's the idea of having two sides to this uh, breastplate. And they did bind the breastplate by the rings into the rings of the ephod with a lace of blue. Okay, so they're binding the breastplate uh, by his rings unto the rings of the ephod. So the ephod has rings. We're going to see that you can't see it here except these little things. This breastplate is connected to the ephod, which is this, you know, this uh, several colored thing. And it has rings. So the rings of the ephod with a lace of blue. So here they're combined from the uh, Urim and the Thummim. Those are combined with the golden chain. But this thing here is connected to the ephod with the blue. And the blue, of course, is representing the righteousness or the faithfulness to the commandments so that you don't go a whoring, kind of like the woman with the daughters in Revelation 17. That it might be above the curious girdle of the ephod and that the breastplate might be loosed from the ephod. And the Lord commanded Moses. Oh, so there you go. The breastplate would be loosed from the ephod. That means that the uh, breastplate is actually not woven in like I thought it was. So this right here is not woven together with the ephod as I was trying to describe earlier. It must just be woven with the same kind of material as the ephod. So that's, that makes better sense to me. Okay, so that it might be loosed. So now you can separate the, ble the breastplate from the um, ephod, okay? And so that's why it's the breastplate that's loosed from the ephod, as the Lord had commanded Moses. So again, this phrase is something that comes up quite a bit because we are making the sanctuary exactly as God had commanded, is the point. He made the robe of the ephod of woven work all of blue. And that's the back one, this, this whole back thing here of blue. That was the robe. And there was a hole in the midst of the robe, which would be right here at the top, okay? So this hole at the midst of the robe, a hole as of the chain mail, kind of like when you're going to war and you have um, almost like a bulletproof garment over you with a band round about the hole that it should not rend. And so right up here where this is squared, you have a hole, but there's a band that's woven into it so you don't rip it. This is not supposed to be ripped. Remember we talked about before where the high priest actually rent the garment. He should have been put to death right on the spot as a result of ripping that garment. What he was doing is he was doing the same thing that uh, God had commanded not to be done, was to misrepresent his 
um, illustrative garments. And so it was not to be rent that it should not rend. Okay, so when he did rip that garment, the high priest during the time of Christ on the earth, that was a big deal. And if you read Ellen White's comments on it, she said that shouldn't have happened. And so verse 24, they made upon the hems of the robe pomegranates of blue and of purple, of scarlet, and fine twine linen. And I think that's really interesting because I used to think they were actually pomegranates. And then I learned as a result of this study, not this one now, but the one before, when we looked at it, that they were made of the same colors and material as was the ephod. And so you have these were made next to the bells so that these things would be able to clink against the bells. So when he moved, you'd be able to hear him moving. And why was it important to hear him moving? Well, because he was the only one in the sanctuary during the Day of Atonement. And when he moved, you wanted to know where he was to see if he was still living or not, right? Because if he had unconfessed sins, he was going to drop dead in the presence of a holy God. And so when you have this idea of these pomegranates that are ringing the bells, it's almost like present truth. You are <clears throat> in the sanctuary, in heaven, watching where Christ is. And if you hear the bells moving, you know that he's moved. He's, he's somewhere different. And so this, this idea of listening for where Christ is, even though you can't see him, you're able to find out where he is by the sounds of what's going on. So somehow God is able to illustrate to the people that can't see where present truth is. Christ is in the holy place as the high priest. Christ is in the most holy place as the high priest. So you're able to listen to where he is as a result of those bells that are dinging because of those uh, made, like, how would you say, uh, woven pomegranates, if you will. So I, I think that's part of what it means. They made bells of pure gold and put the bells between the pomegranates upon the hem of the robe. The hem would be blue, remember. Round about between the pomegranates. So there was a bell and a pomegranate, a bell and a pomegranate. And that's because the bells would help uh, be rung by those pomegranates round about the hem of the robe to minister as the Lord commanded Moses. So there's that phrase again. We're doing it just like God said. We have a record of it. And they made coats of fine linen of woven, woven work for Aaron. And these, this coat is very similar to what Christ is illustrated in uh, during the reading of chapter 1 of the Revelation. And it's for his sons. And it's a miter of fine linen as well. And goodly bonnets of fine linen and linen breeches of fine twined linen. So that's what the regular priests would wear. And there's a girdle of fine twined linen of blue, purple, and scarlet of needlework. Now, in Revelation, Christ is wearing a garment of gold, a golden girdle. But here it's talking about there is the uh, twined linen of blue, purple, scarlet uh, with needlework. And so I'm wondering, could it be, I'm only asking the question because I don't know, but could it be that the general priests would wear the same clothes that Christ is illustrated in, in Revelation chapter 1, but they would have a girdle with the blue, the scarlet, and the, the um, purple. But maybe the high priest would wear a different girdle of gold. I'm not sure. I'm just wondering because we do have Christ dressed differently in Revelation chapter 1, and he is the high priest though at that time he was dressed as a regular priest. So I'm trying to figure it out. I guess I'll find that one out in heaven. Unless you guys know, you can help educate me. But um, it seems, though, that these general priests were wearing that, whereas Christ was in a golden girdle as the high priest. And this was all as the Lord commanded Moses. And they made the plate of the holy crown of pure gold. And they wrote upon that writing, like the engraving of a signet, so it was done well, and it was done into the gold, so it wasn't like going to be etched off some someday in the future. Holiness to the Lord. And that holiness mattered, because that's why the high priest was acceptable to the Father during the day of not only regular service, but the day of atonement. It was because on the forehead, which is, you know, where the plate was, it was named holiness to the Lord. And they tied unto it a lace of blue, remember? And I was talking about before how during this picture you have a lace of gold. But it was actually supposed to be a lace of blue on the miter that would um, keep this section which says holiness to the Lord onto the head. Because the blue 
obedience is what brings holiness. And so it's not just faith that is uh, tried in the fire. It is the blue combined with the faith tried in the fire that brings holiness to the Lord. And that's why the blue matters there. And it's to fasten on the high priest on the mitre as the Lord had commanded Moses. Thus was all the work of the tabernacle of the tent of the congregation finished. So now, whew, there it is. We've done all the various articles. We've finished it. And the children of Israel did according to all that the Lord had commanded Moses. So did they. And they brought the tabernacle unto Moses. They brought the tent and all the furniture. Remember, it was like 15,000 pounds we talked about yesterday. His tashes, the boards, the bars, the pillars, the sockets, the coverings of ram skins dyed red, the coverings of badger skins, the veil of the covering, the ark of the testimony, the staves thereof, the mercy seat, the table, the vessels thereof, and the showbread, the pure candlestick with the lamps thereof, even with the lamps to be set in the order, and all the vessels thereof, and the oil for the light, the golden altar, the anointing oil, the sweet incense, the hangings for the tabernacle door, the brazen altar, his grate of brass, his staves, all the vessels, the laver at his foot, or and his foot, the hangings of the court, his pillars, the sockets, the hangings for the court gate, his cords, the pins, and all the vessels of the service of the tabernacle for the tent of the congregation, the clothes of the service to do service in the holy place, and the holy garments for Aaron the priest, and the son's garments to minister in the priest's office, according to all that the Lord commanded Moses. So the children of Israel made all the work. And Moses did look upon all the work, and behold, they had done it as the Lord had commanded. Even so had they done it, and Moses blessed them. So there it is. You have like, we got one more chapter, and that's the anointing of everything. And that's important because now we're going to understand how it all worked out in the heavens during the time Christ ascended. But see, what we have is that we have this illustration of the work being done as God had commanded. And I'm telling you, there was a comment earlier this morning before we started the service, before we started the, the speaking part, that there's a wish for unity in the One True God movement. And I wish the same. I wish we could all be unified and happy. And I don't know at this point that we need to say everything the same way, but what we need is the unity of spirit. What that means is, we're all willing to say, hey, I don't know everything, but I'm willing to learn. If we all had that spirit, which we're told in the writings of Sister White, that we need the unity of spirit. If we all had that unity of spirit, we could come together, even with our differences, and we could come together and realize like, wow, you explained that far better than I would was able to do so, and, and I've learned in your explanation. I'm thankful that the way you've said it. If we could all come together and do that, then we'd start being able to say all the same things. But right now, what we need is the right spirit. And so if we have the right spirit, then we'll be able to do all that the Lord had commanded, making up this temple that God is trying to build with his people. And you, like me, are one of these living stones. And some of us are still kind of out of shape and rugged. And, you know, like you talk to this person, the one that's out of shape and rugged, and they'll bite you. You know, don't tell me I'm wrong. Yeah, you know, they're just angry and, and frustrated. But, you know, there are some people that maybe they've been hewn a little bit more and maybe they're a little bit more ready for their place in the temple. And God is looking for those people so that he can build that temple. And then what's going to happen in chapter 40? There's going to be the anointing. The glory of the Lord will fill the temple. And we're going to be ready to go home. God is waiting for his people. And I think we're going to need the spirit that was given to Aholiab and to Bezalel, which was the spirit of knowledge, of understanding, and wisdom. And that's all mental, remember? If we have that same spirit that they had, we're going to be able to build the same temple so that we can be unified. And if we can have that unification, God will be able to pour out his spirit as he did in the early reign, which was through the ministration of holy angels. And he's going to be able to do it at the end of time, which, like it says in Revelation 18, is through the ministration of a holy angel. It lightens the world with his glory, which is the angel's glory. And so you find that, well, okay, it's God reflected through the angel, but it's the angel that lightens the earth with his glory. Okay, so it's God's glory, but through the angel as God uses his agents. So what we're waiting for is the hewing, the preparing, the final needlework being done in our characters 
so that there's a finished work with no thread of human devising. We want Christ in you, the hope of glory. And if that's the case, then we're ready. You know, we're ready for this temple to be filled with the glory of God. And I think that's what I've learned in this chapter, is that we need to do everything in our character preparation, because we are the temples. We are individual soul temples. But I think even more important than that, and what the Bible describes more uh, frequently, is that us together make up the main temple. So we, we each have an individual soul temple. I get that. We each have our own mind. But if our minds are combined and connected, then all of our minds together will make the temple that God wants to fill with glory. And so, uh, yeah, we need to be able to be unified. And I agree with that comment, dear brother uh, Richard. Thank you for making it. So let's pray together, asking that God will continue to help us to finish the fine details of the gold and the silver and the bronze and the purple and the scarlet and the blue and the fine linen, all the things that need to be worked. There's a lot of stuff here. There's a lot of weight to carry. This is not just for one person to move this tabernacle where it needs to go. This is a lot of people that got to work together under the direction of God's agents, Moses, Aaron, Aholiab, Bezalel, and all the group that are working with them, right? So we need to all work together. Let's, let's pray that God will do this for us. Let's bow our heads. Our Father in heaven, please continue to lead and guide us. We want to be unified. We want to be a finished work. We want to be as the Lord commanded Moses. We pray that you'd lead us, that we can know what services you've called us to do and how to do them well and faithfully. Lord, you've said many are called, few are chosen. And then you described in Revelation 17 that those that are with your son, the lamb, are called, chosen, and faithful. Please make us faithful. Help us to be faithful 100% of the time for you, with you, for the purposes that you have called us to and that we'll be able to bring glory to your name, not only individually, that they may see our good works and glorify you, our Father which is in heaven, but also corporately they will be able to see a people that actually want to reflect your image. And of course we know that will bring persecution, but ultimately it will bring deliverance from this world and will be brought to where you are. So please continue to have mercy and long-suffering and patience with us that we will be prepared as you wish us to be. Thank you for this. In Jesus' holy name, amen. The breastplate, that was just two plates put together, right? It seems to me that way, yes. Um, and, and that made sense to me to capture the... Stones. The rubies or whatever. Yeah. Um, but then I started thinking, you got to have a counterweight on your back to support all that weight in the front, or it will fall. Clothing is not going to hold that. So I'm wondering if that is, or that means the back side. Oh, maybe. As a counterweight huh that's interesting <laughs> yeah because you know i mean i don't know how it thin it was. they captured the 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 rubies and jewels sapphires you know you gotta have a way to capture that but i guess you can you know build an edge on the front and back but then at the same time you got to have something to counterweight that weight in the front right that makes a lot of sense and I, I'm just thinking, I'm not saying you're wrong, but I'm just thinking with you that it could be that the uh, hole in the neck where the head would come through, the 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 neck would maybe bear that weight uh, because it oh, wouldn't... It's heavy. It, it would be. Yeah, I'm not sure how heavy, but yeah, it, it would be. <laughs> you're, you got a good point. <laughs> Gold can, is heavy, right? Yeah. Oh, nice point. I like that. Well, I guess we'll have to see in heaven then, huh? <laughs> yeah. Something along uh, that, or in the same idea here, uh, I was I kind of visualize that it's sort of like stained glass work. Okay. How you, put, you know, you kind of weave it in together, and the stones like a grid almost. Okay. 
uh, the breast pain. But I think uh, he's you, Eric's definitely onto something. I mean, that's uh, that's a lot of weight on the neck, and especially when it's gold and you get you know the stone. So that's yeah. All right. Yeah. <laughs> oh, that's interesting. Just the the uh, practicality of it would would almost demand that, wouldn't it? <laughs>